algebra studies the similarities between seemingly unrelated mathematical structures so we might look at real numbers and matrices and functions. And real numbers and matrices and functions, you know, are three very different types of things. A real number is a number. A matrix is an array, a function is a rule that takes inputs and uniquely assigns them to outputs. And yet they have properties in common. For example, we have addition of real numbers, we have addition of matrices, we have addition of functions. That last one done in the natural way. So even though these are very different looking objects, we can multiply or we can add real numbers together. We can add matrices together. We can add functions together. So we've got addition. And we've got in all three of these cases, we can take an object and we can multiply it by a real number. So for real numbers, that's obvious. You have a real number, you multiply it by another real number, that's just regular multiplication. For matrices, that's scalar multiplication. For functions, I mean, you define this in the natural way. Multiplying f of x by a real number a just takes the function and multiplies it by a. And then real numbers, matrices, functions, they all have addition, they all have multiplication by real numbers, and then they all have the property that this multiplication distributes over this addition whether capital M and capital N are real numbers or matrices or functions, that thing I just wrote in the far right column is a true statement. So at this point you're thinking, well, these, I mean, these seemingly very different types of objects actually have a lot in common. And Algebra asks, well, what properties do these have in common? What properties don't they have in common? And the way algebraists go about that question is to define special kinds of objects, like groups and rings and fields. And you can say, well, 
the real numbers and the convex numbers are similar because they're both fields. And that means they have some of these properties in common. Um, linear algebra is part of that. I mean, it's, it's correctly named. And we are therefore going to define now an algebraic structure. And the algebraic structure we are going to define is called a vector space. Definition. A vector, bless you, a vector space is a set of objects called vectors. with some properties. And uh, we're calling these objects vectors, but we are not now talking about the column vectors we've been working with. It's, it's maybe slightly confusing terminology. I mean, I guess you could, you could sort of compare it to like, working with complex numbers, where we talk about numbers for like grades one through 12, and we really mean real numbers, and we don't bother to say that, we just say numbers, and then suddenly we get a different kind of number when we introduce the imaginary unit. So, it's a set of objects that we're calling vectors, but which are not necessarily the column vectors we've been looking at. And to be a vector space, we have to have some proper. So this set has addition, defined on it. By which I mean, we can add two vectors and scalar multiplication by real numbers. That is, we can multiply a vector by a real number. And this still isn't enough. Um, simply having an operation that we're calling addition and having an operation that we're calling scaled or multiplication doesn't make a set a vector space. It requires the following. So first, this is sometimes included in the big list of properties that, that, um, that these operations have to have. I'm going to state it separately of the list. addition and scalar 
multiplication must be closed. Even as I say it, this is not the correct, I'm realizing not quite the correct terminology. What I should be saying is the vector space is closed under addition and scale their multiplication. Let it go. Um, what we're saying is that if we've got one vector and I, I, gosh, I guess I'm going to keep using this bar notation, but again, we're not necessarily looking at column vectors here. If we've got one vector plus another vector, the result is a vector. If we take a vector and scale or multiply it by a real number, that's a vector. So in addition to addition and scale or multiplication, not taking us out of the vector space, in addition to being closed under these operations, addition and scale or multiplication have to have certain properties. And this list of properties may be familiar to you because this is the third time we've seen this list. Addition is commutative. Addition is associative. There is a zero vector such that addition by the zero vector doesn't change other vectors. Vectors. For every vector U, U plus the scale or product of negative one times U equals the zero vector which we and we also just put it like that, that u minus u equals zero. A scalar multiplication distribute over vector addition. I run out of space, but if we've got scalar addition, that also distributes. We can move scalars around. And one times a vector equals that vector. And I've said we've seen this list before, 
This was the exact list of properties I said that vectors have. And then we introduced matrix addition and stuff. And I gave this exact same list for matrices. So column vectors are a vector space, as you might expect. Matrices are also a vector space. We've, I mean, we didn't have the word back then, but we said that matrices satisfy this list of eight conditions. So we were really saying that they are a vector space. And, and there are a bunch of vector spaces. Um, so let's clear, clear, clear. Um, an example we haven't seen before, but the set of all real valued functions. is a vector space. So for our purposes, um, we're, go we're just going to assume the domain is the real numbers. So the functions that take all the real numbers and assign them to other real numbers, that's a vector space. And I, we define the addition of two functions in what I think is the very natural way. And we define a scalar times a function again in what I think is probably the most natural way. So if um, if f is the sine of x and g is x squared, then f plus g is the sine of x plus x squared and four times f would be four times the sine of x. Uh, this is a vector space, and I don't necessarily want to go through all eight properties because it's it's pretty tedious, but let's, let's show a few of these properties. Let, let's show how this is done. If we wanted to demonstrate that the set of all real valued functions is a vector space. Let's show that f plus g equals g plus f. The first vector space property, the property of commutivity. Yeah. Um, to show this, we need to know what it means for two functions to be default, to be equal to each other. I mean, we'll say, notice that I stopped using, um, stopped writing the of x part. That's to make this clearer. We'll say that a function f equals a function g if f of x equals g of x for all real valued x's. So here on this frame, F and G 
our functions and f of x and g of x are numbers. They're the output when x is your input. And if you make that distinction, then showing that addition is commutative becomes trivial because it just turns into statements about real numbers. So for f, for the function f plus g to equal the function g plus f, f plus g of x must equal g plus f of x for all real number x's. Is this familiar notation for everyone? Upside down, a reads for all. Well, by the way, we've defined addition. This is the same as saying that f of x plus g of x should equal g of x plus f of x for all x. And then because f of x and g of x are numbers, and numbers are definitely commutative. When you're adding numbers together, it does not matter what order you're adding them in. This just is a true statement. f of x plus g of x does equal g of x plus f of x for all x. So f plus g of x equals g plus f of x for all x. So by the way, we've defined a quality f plus g does equal g plus f. And then, I mean, you can probably imagine how this argument works. Like if you want to show associativity, I'm not going to write this all on the board, but it's the same argument. For this to be true, this function applied to x should equal this function applied to x for every x. And then, well, even though I said that, I guess at this point I might as well finish it out. This is the statement that f plus g of x plus h of x equals f of x plus g plus, didn't want that, of g plus h of x. Over here, f plus g of x is f of x plus g of x. Over here, g plus h of x is g of x plus h of x. And now we're pretty much done. 
This last statement is true because f of x, p of x, h of x are just numbers and numbers have this associative property. So if this last statement is true for all x, the second to that statement is true for all x, which means the second statement is true for all x, which means the first statement's true because that's how we define the quality of functions. Let's see. There should be a zero vector. f of x equals zero, the constant function is the zero vector. We define negative functions in the natural way. So like if f is the sine negative f is the negative sign. There are these negative functions. Uh, distribution works. And again, the argument for distribution is basically the same as the argument for commutivity and the argument for associativity. Um, because real numbers commute functions also end up having that not commute, distribute. Uh, functions end up having that property. You can move scalars around with functions. One times a function is still that function. One times the sine is the sine. So functions, the space of functions is a vector space. Questions so far? Then let's introduce a very important topic. And I mean, I'll put the definition on the board, but first let's just reach for it and see if we can see if we can get it. We've said that the space. Let's say set. So this doesn't sound sort of circular. The set of all functions, all real valued functions, is a vector. Space. Now, let's ask a question. Is the set of all continuous? Functions a vector space. So the the naive way to approach this question would be to say, well, to be a vector space, we need eight properties. So let's check whether the space of the set, I guess I'm giving away the answer here. Let's check whether the set of continuous functions has all of the properties we need it to have. 
So if we did that, we would start with commutivity. And we'd say, well, for this set of continuous functions to be a commutative, this equality up here has to hold. We've defined this equality as holding. If this holds for all x, and hopefully, once we got to this point of the process, we'd pause and say, wait a minute, uh, th this is familiar. I have already made this exact argument. In particular, I made the argument, come on, Zoom, that if f and g are any two functions, then f plus g equals g plus f. Well, if this is true for every function, it's certainly true for the continuous functions. And then I made the argument, well, for every function, f, g, and h, this addition is associative. Well, if addition is associative for every function, addition is certainly associative for the continuous functions. So again, if I want to show that the continuous functions are a vector space, I don't need to show this again. I've already shown it. And um, this is true for most of the vector space properties. If you show that every function f has an additive inverse, then certainly commutative function, then certainly continuous functions have additive inverses. If you show that scalar multiplication distributes over addition for every function, it's certainly true for continuous functions. If you show that scalar multiplication distributes over scalar addition for every function, true for continuous functions. Uh, you can rearrange scalars for every function. You can do it with the continuous functions. One times any function is still that function. So one times any continuous function is still that function. So the situation we're in here, is we've got the functions. We know this is a vector space. And living inside this set, we have a smaller set. And Almost every um, property that a set needs to have to be a vector space is just directly inherited here. There are only a few things that we don't get automatically. So in a situation like this, if we want to know that something's a vector space, there are just a few things that we need to check. If 
W is living inside of V. And V is a vector space. Then W is also a vector space if three things are satisfied. Two of these are things that weren't on the eight element list. To be a vector space, you need to be closed under addition. To be a vector space, you need to be closed under scalar multiplication. And to be a vector space, the zero vector needs to be in W. These are the only things that aren't inherited. So going back to functions and continuous functions, we know that the set of functions is closed. If we have a function plus another function, the result is a function. That's not an inherited property. It doesn't tell us that a continuous function plus a continuous function is a continuous function. And the function space is closed under scalar multiplication. So a function times a scalar is a function. Again, we need more than that. We need that a scalar times a continuous function is a continuous function. And zero, well, we know that there is a zero function, but what if it's not continuous? So that's the third property that is not inherited. And now if you can cast your mind back to calculus, uh, it is true that the sum of continuous functions is continuous. It is true, the product of continuous functions is continuous and scalars are continuous. So this set is closed under scalar multiplication. The zero function f of x equals zero is certainly continuous. So the set of continuous real valued functions is continuous. And you don't have to check, I guess with uh, closure, I guess um, to be a vector space, you have to have 10 properties. Um, the eight properties I listed as numbers one through eight, and then and then the closure properties. So it's 10 properties to be a vector space. But if we're living inside something that we already know is a vector space, we only need to check three properties. In this situation, W is called a subspace 
of So we've got, we've got a really important example of a subspace. Uh, it's so important though, that I don't want to squish it in in five minutes. Let's do a few examples where we don't have subspaces. Um, so the set of real numbers is a vector space. And that's, I mean, I hope that's that's basically obvious. Where's this list of properties? I mean, Real addition is commutative. Real addition is associative. The number zero exists. Given any number, you can whack a negative sign in front of it. Um, addition does. In fact, in this case, uh, five and six end up being the same thing because scalar multiplication, our scalars and our vectors are both real numbers, but we've got that uh, distribution. This is the statement number seven is a statement that uh, real multiplication is associative and one times a real number is that real number. Um, shoe, a set of rational numbers fails to be a subspace. Um, the reason it fails to be a subspace, zero is in there, and it's closed under addition. A rational number plus a rational number is rational. But if we, we can have a rational number and we can scale or multiply by a real number, and no longer be rational. Um, two is rational, pi is a perfectly valid scalar. I mean, the scalars are all the real numbers. So this is a scalar product, a scalar times a rational number. and it's not in the cube. So we lose our, um, we don't have the closure that we need. The irrational numbers, also not a vector space, why not? This is like a five second argument, but which doesn't make it obvious. I'm just saying it's, you don't need to like write a bunch of stuff down to get this. Is there anything, I mean, this is basically giving the answer, but is there anything that has to be in a vector space, but which is not an irrational number? I mean, in particular, okay, we're running out of time. So let's just say this, zero is not irrational. So zero is not in this set. Um, it also doesn't have uh, closure properties. Uh, pi is irrational. Negative pi is irrational. Um, negative pi plus pi is zero, which is rational. So it fails on a few categories 
and we are out of time and I will see you all on Thursday.